Infinitives in Greek are luckily quite simple to form and use and therefore come relatively early in this book because they're going to be something that will really enhance the Greek you can read without putting too much pressure on you. They are a linguistic mood, so I want you to pause and think about the moods you've met so far. You've met the indicative, and this just means the normal. You've met the subjunctive, that's the kind of marked for some kind of extra clause move, and you've met the imperative, which is how you give an order. And you've met some basic endings for each of these. Luo, lues, lue. There, in the indicative. Luor, lues, luer, in the subjunctive. So I've put the first three parts of that verb up there so you can see clearly where the differences are. Because, of course, in the first person singular, they're the same. And then you've met the imperative. And I'm just putting in the present active at this point, lue, luete. So, I untie. A different way of saying I untie, depending on the context. And the order untie. Those are the moods you've met so far. We're now adding the new one. That's the infinitive. Infinitives in Greek work very much like English ones a lot of the time, so you might find these aren't too challenging to get to grips with. Form-wise, they're relatively straightforward. Your indicative would have lu-or as an ending, the infinitive lu ain. I've put in the contract verbs because these are introduced in Dobson, it's important you get to grips with them. Agapa or, remember you've had your vowels in there, file or and plero or is going to give you agapan, filain and plerun. So ain is the ending you're looking for in the infinitive and they're indeclinable. It's not going to change once you've got the present active infinitive. Present active. But there are a couple of variations on a theme. Noticeably, the agapan and plerun, where that iota is no longer evident. So it's quite easy to spot luane, filane, because it's epsilon, iota, new. That's a pretty distinctive set of letters but the iota drops out in agapan and plerun, and you've just got the lengthened vowels with the new. So, luain, that's your basic form. Philain shows up with the et-o verbs, but the uh-o and the o verbs are a little bit different. In this chapter, you're also introduced to the word erxato. This is the aorist of the verb archomai, meaning I begin. It's an aorist middle. Third person singular. It means he, she, it began. And you can feel that in English that's immediately going to be followed by to do something. So the important thing is that will then be followed by an infinitive. So one of the major uses you have of the infinitive in Greek is what's called the complementary infinitive, which means it completes the verb. So it's complementary, not complementary, giving you completion. If you're a Daily Dose of Greek fan, these are the ones that he puts on a fake Scottish accent for and says it's just wishing, it's just wanting to be followed by an infinitive. He's got this routine for dealing with complementary infinitives. If you get one of these verbs like begin or want or need, any of those things where you might instinctively put an infinitive in English, the same is likely to be true in Greek. So Dobson introduces this one form, erxato. Uh, it's a form of the verb you haven't met yet, so I wanted to gloss it. That's what's going on with the infinitive. It's the complementary infinitive. I thought I'd also start looking at vocab in these chapters so that you've got a chance to reflect on the vocab before we use it. Erxator was already given to you, so I'm not adding that in, although you have got the plural on page 102 of Erxanto. But you have got some other verbs here. Fellow, I want or wish. 
you can feel that that might want two things afterwards. You might want, I want something, an object, or I want to do something, which is going to be an infinitive. So there's two different ways of using cello, at least, one of which is going to take an infinitive. Worth bearing in mind, classically, this is more likely to also have an epsilon in the front. That epsilon drops out so that you sometimes see it, you sometimes don't, and it shows up in the past tense of ethylo in the New Testament, because as you've learned with the imperfect, past tenses then have an augment on the front, and very few verbs start with an epsilon normally. So you'll find that ethylo in past tenses starts with an eta, not an epsilon. Because there was originally an epsilon at the front of that word. Her exousia, authority or power. You can break it up as having something to do with being and a preposition on the front. I'm not sure that actually helps, but it is quite a common word in the New Testament and one worth learning. That ia is going to be like oikia. And it's going to keep its alpha all the way through. Ballo, I throw. This is a very irregular verb. You will get used to it as you work through irregular verbs. But just learn it for now in the present tense and we'll deal with what happens to it later. Caruso, I preach or proclaim. I would always say announce A kerux, the noun that comes from that, is a messenger. So this is, I bring a message of some kind or another. You've also got the noun, tothalema. Anything that's got ma at the end is going to be a neuter word. And it's going to be the product of a verb. So this is the product of wanting, i.e. the wish or will. what it is that you want. You'll see more of that in chapter 44, but it's worth building up a series of how those kind of words work now.